All right. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. It seems like people are still putting a few responses here into the poll, and you're welcome to keep doing that here while we're um, while we're starting up because we're going to go through first this exercise number three, three <clears throat> and um, and a little bit of what you had to do there. So we'll leave the poll live. Uh, we won't have it on screen here, but if you have questions that come up as we're going through the exercise that you're like, oh, right, I forgot about this, go ahead and feel free to add those to the poll, and that way we can try to address those questions as well. Uh, otherwise, I guess I'll let yeah. take the time to leave here. Maybe we start, so let's switch the screens. So, yes, we had the... Uh, does it work? It's laptop too. Ah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Okay, now it works. Cool. Uh, yeah, so we had the exercise three, uh, and you had some uh, comments about it. Problem three was difficult. The for loop is not clear to me at all. Uh, assignments are not always clear to me. Everything, it took nine hours to finish all three exercises. <laughs> Yeah, it might take time uh, to learn learn these things. Uh, it's it has been the same for all of us, I I think. So sometimes you might want to bang your head on the table, and but that's life. That's how, that's how it is. But uh, don't worry, it will get easier once you get a little bit more experience with it. Uh, yeah, but anyway, so in the exercise three. We had basically three uh, different problems and one extra one. Uh, about the problem one, so was it clear? Was it easy? Because I think it should have been quite straightforward thing to do. So I will only skip that if you don't have any specific question about it. I guess not. So yeah. Are there any questions about problem one? Like maybe you can raise your hand if you have questions. Uh, there are. Uh, we haven't decided what to do with them. Do we share them or not? We kind of have thought about it last year already and we kind of decided not to. But but, but basically, if you have any question about it, so basically we kind of now would go through them and, and we will show you now the, the answers, but we won't provide you the actual codes for producing, producing these. Okay, uh, we can go and check the solution for uh, first exercise as well. Uh, just maybe... To like this. Uh, so basically, uh, the first uh, exercise of the problem one was about producing these kind of file names with with certain base name, kind of root name, and then some uh, number coming after it. And basically, we wanted to create this kind of uh, name variable name called base name which has station in here, then we wanted to create an empty list called file names. And then what we wanted to do was to create this kind of name station one dot txt, station two dot txt and so on. So basically how we do this is that we, as we uh, went through last lesson, uh, the how to use for loops and, and the range function. So basically here we iterate uh, 21 times, so from 0 to number 20. And basically what we do here is that we create the, the station 0.txt by combining these different strings. And what was the kind of uh, uh, thing to notice here was that when you have this number, you need to convert that number into string and then you can combine that number with or, or the, at that point it is a, a piece of text and then you can combine all these different 
components of the text and then add it to the file names. So this is quite, uh, should be quite straightforward thing to do. Uh, so that maybe, was... Maybe one thing. Yeah. Um, I don't, did we go through creating empty lists in the lesson or was that something that confused you guys that you can make a list that doesn't have anything in it and then append values to fill the list? Was that, I don't remember, was there a hint about that or was it just... Yeah, I don't actually remember. Was there any confusion about that, about this, the fact that you can make an empty list? Because there aren't other variable types necessarily that you could just make empty. Um, but lists, you can just create a list and then add values yeah. as you like with this. And you can create added. an empty string as well. Yeah. yeah, the yeah. Content. yeah. But you cannot create empty number. That's kind of not possible. So I don't know if maybe that's just seeing here and how that was done, if that maybe helps a little bit because um, if you don't create an empty list, it gets a little bit more difficult to do this. And as you'll see in Python, there's always dozens of different ways you can solve the same problem. Mm. And uh, probably some of you came up with quite complicated ways to solve this problem, uh, especially if you didn't create an empty list. Yeah. Yep. Generally, we try if there's something like that in the exercise to include a hint if it's something that we haven't covered in lecture just so that you're not stuck. Uh, so maybe that's a good reminder that you should you know, regularly check in on that hints document if you are stuck in the exercise because chances are, as best we can, we try to anticipate these yeah. kind of problems. Yeah. Maybe we actually, as there were a couple of uh, comments about that for loop is not clear to me at all. So maybe I just once more kind of go through the first uh, problem and, and, and write it down here. Uh, I hope you can, you can see this. Uh, yeah, but, but basically how we uh, do this was that we needed to create a base name that equals to uh, station. And what else did we need to do? We needed to create an empty list. So how you create an empty list called file names. So basically you define it by <coughs> like this. So you just put the square brackets without any content inside. So that's you create an empty list. And then you can add stuff in there. And that is what we want to do in this case. And, and then what we wanted to do was to iterate over the number range 0 to 20 and then combine to have this kind of output. So let's do that. So basically when we wanted to do a for loop, so we define it with this for uh, in the beginning and then and we put some for num in range and the range function says that iterate x a number of times uh, and what we wanted to do is to iterate 21 times so from 0 to 20 because the this number shows at what point you should stop and then you always specify the colon and then whatever you want to do, kind of what all the functions that you want to repeat number of times, those things you should put inside the for loop. So Boko mentioned that this has had been a bit uh, difficult to understand for some, some one of you. So basically I will now just do, so what I want to do is that I want to create uh, the variable x number of times and what the variable should be it should be this kind of uh, text and for that I uh, yeah 
So I create a variable called station. And for that station, what I want to do is that I want to combine the base name. So the station will get the base name. Then I want to add the underscore. So actually that should be here like this. And then what I want to add there is the number. And this was the case because this is now a numer numerical number. So we want to convert that to string. So in this case, I use this str function that converts uh, nu num uh, <coughs> uh, these numeric values into strings and then put the number inside there. And then the last thing that I want to add there was the .txt. So .txt and like that. And basically now what happens, maybe I put this bigger. What happens is that it creates this kind of variable basically 21 times. And at each time uh, it updates the number because this range function uh, basically does so that it iterates fr values from zero up to 20 and, and updates the, the variable num at each iteration. So that number will be updated here and then basically we will have a different name uh, in this uh, station variable. I can print that out so we can actually see uh, what happens and when basically I uh, execute this script you can see that we have station 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and, and so on up to station 20.txt. So now everything that we did was inside this loop so basically we iterated and did some uh, command or executed some stuff inside here. And the la uh, last thing that we wanted to do was that uh, in each iteration we wanted to add the station. So this text into this file names list. So we need to do that. Add the file name into the list. And basically how we did that was that we said that we want to add it to this file name and then we have this append uh, uh, function here. Uh, and by putting the station inside this uh, here so we can add it to these file names. And basically if I run this now again, oh not that. Uh, like here. So now we don't print anything, but now once I check what is inside this file names, uh, like this. So here we have a list of of file um, of these file names inside the list. So basically, we did two different uh, commands inside this for loop. So first we created the name, and then we added that name into the list. And basically something that was a bit uh, confusing for someone was that, okay, what happens if I now do like this? So that basically uh, when does the for loop stop and what should you put inside the for loop and what you sh should you put like uh, after the for loop? Uh, so basically when I, for example, now would like to count the number of file names in that list. So basically I won't want to do it inside this for loop because then I would count it every time when I do a one iteration. So basically I want to first add those uh, values into that list and then when the list is ready then I want to count how many items do I have in that list. So let's do that. I create a variable list count uh, is 
and how we could uh, check the length or the, the how many items we can use this len function and then uh, we can put len file names and basically now when I again run this script we should have the file names again but then when these, this list uh, has been created we should have this list count as well and we have 20, 21 items in that list so basically you put the indentation and, and as long as these things are intended those things will be repeated uh, the amount that amount of times how much uh, how many uh, times you have basically set that iterate in this case 21 times and then when you take the indentation off so you put these here then you will start doing stuff one time uh, one, one time per, per command so we can say list count is here then we can print the result list so these will now be done only and executed only one times one time and when doing this so now it only one once uh, produces this variable and then it only once prints out the file names not there uh, this yeah and now it printed out that one so i hope this uh, helped a little bit of understanding what the how the for loops work um, if you i guess this is something at least it was for me uh, a bit uh, confusing in the beginning but you use loops a lot when doing programming and when you get repetitions of, of using these it kind of gets familiar after a while so don't worry if, if it seems a bit uh, confusing at the at the moment you will you will learn learn later how to do okay so that's about it uh, then we have the problem two so in this case we wanted to uh, basically classify temperatures to different classes uh, so cold slippery comfortable and warm and and for this uh, exercise you had the uh, this kind of starter script where we had the values and then you just needed to basically uh, execute or, or write the steps that was mentioned there and it looks like this so here you have the temperatures and these were the things that you wanted to classify there were some uh, unfortunate uh, typos in the uh, in this script so for example here I, I originally created six classes but then I decided that I only want four because you would have needed to do more more these conditional statements that kind of would have get a bit boring so I'm, I'm sorry about that it raised some confusion but basically what we wanted to do here is that we wanted to create empty lists and here basically how you do those is that you define the variable name and then put the square brackets and that's a basically empty list and then we wanted to do these uh, conditional statements and we wanted to basically do this kind of use this kind of criteria to separate the values and, and add those values into these different lists so how we did uh, can do those so basically again we take advantage of the for loop and in this case we can do it like this like uh, for temp so temperature in temperatures so we iterate one value at the time and, and go through these values and then inside this loop we check is the temperature below minus two which would be this cold if if yes then add that value into this cold list if it if it was not uh, below minus two uh, so if it was uh, equal or 
uh, larger than minus 2 or uh, smaller than plus 2, then you should add it to this slippery uh, list. Uh, there wasn't mentioned like uh, if you basically see that if you have a value of 2, should it belong to this slippery list or this comfortable list? It should belong to either one of them, but in this exercise it didn't matter. But it is kind of important that either in this condition or in this condition you would use this uh, equals to uh, or is larger than. Because if we only use uh, is larger than operator and is smaller than operator, then you end up in a situation that minus two doesn't go to anywhere. And that is not something that we want to do. In the exercise uh, four, so this week, I have explicitly said that which number should belong to which, which uh, kind of class. We are continuing these kind of things this week. So that is maybe something that was a bit confusing and there was a question about it. So basically this, this is how, how it should have been done. Uh, did you have? Yeah, I was going to add just one thing here. Um, and I, sorry, I wasn't paying attention to what you were just saying, so maybe you said this. But uh, if you look at the logic here, we start first by checking to see if the temperature is less than negative 2. That's the smallest value we're going to consider. And if it's not, then we move to a warmer temperature and say, okay, well, are you colder or is it less than some warmer temperature value and so on and so <coughs> forth. Uh, so one thing you might note here is that you don't necessarily need to use this pair of statements to do the same kind of logical test. To establish if you're within a range of numbers, you can do this in a slightly simpler way by saying if temperature is less than minus two, L if temperature is less than 2, L if temperature is less than 15, else, and uh, maybe that doesn't make sense to say it that quickly. But the idea here basically is that we don't need to necessarily check to see if the temperature is greater than or equal to minus 2 because we know, of course, it has to be greater than or equal to not minus 2 if it is not less than negative 2. So this is the kind of part of the logic of these conditional statements that can get kind of confusing and... Uh, Actually, in the exercise three hints, there, there is this kind of case okay. showing, showing this. Yeah. So if you have checked those, but if you want to... Well, maybe I'll just kind of put my point on the board here just quickly in case uh, any of you are curious. Uh, and maybe I'll do it here so that there's a chance it'll be on the screen capture. So the point here is that we have if, and sorry about that, if temp is less than minus 2 and some stuff that happens if that's the case. Now we know if this is false and we get down to this LF statement here, we know the temperature must be greater than minus 2. That's the only way in which we can get to this statement. So we don't need to check if the temperature is greater than or equal to minus 2. We need only to check if it's less than whatever the next value is. So here, all we want to know is, is the temperature now less than 2? And then do some stuff if that's the case. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. There's nothing wrong with doing it this way. The only problem you can have here is that if you don't check to see if the temperature is less than my, uh, less than 2 and greater than or equal to minus 2, you can have some values that don't fall inside the range. So if we said instead L if temp is greater than minus 2 and less than 2, if the temperature is exactly 2, the code won't pass any of those tests. Yeah. So the general point I'm trying to make here is as you get more experience with doing these kind of for loops and dealing with these conditional statements and things like this, you'll start to recognize that sometimes the simpler way to do it is better. And oftentimes you can avoid having things like having to check more than one condition. Yeah. Not always, but oftentimes you can.
can. Yeah, in this case it, it works because we kind of continuously move light to warmer uh, degrees in, in temperature and check those. Uh, but in some cases you don't have these kind of situations that are this, this simple, so then you need to use yeah. those operations. So if instead, like what Hendrik is saying now, if we said, let's check down here, if temp is less than two, and instead up here we check to see if temperature is less than, I don't know, what, 15? Yeah. Yeah. Then we're going to have a problem because the logic that I just described won't work because all of the temperatures that are less than 15 are also less than two. So basically now what happens is that if you remember so the, how the program works, it goes line by line and execute these. And, and with these if and elif statements, the, the first one that co comes out true, so if the condition is true, that will be done and the rest will be skipped. So basically here, if we say that if temperature is minus two, and then the next one is if the temperature is my, uh, plus 15, then it executes this and don't even check this. But so if we have this plus two, which is less than this 15, this won't be ever checked. So that's kind of the logical problem in, in this, this case that we might have. So, and you wouldn't necessarily have that problem if you do it the way that it's done here, because you could put those elif statements in a different order because they check to see the minimum value and the maximum value in the range, and then do something based on that. Um, anyway, maybe it's a small point, but just for some, some of you who have a little bit more programming experience, you might have seen things like this before that you don't necessarily need to have two conditions. Yeah. Okay, maybe we move forward. Uh, then there were some questions and you needed to print out some some stuff, I guess these should have been uh, quite straightforward. There was also an extra uh, extra step or task in this one, but I will skip that because it wasn't. Uh, if you have question about that, so you can just come after the lesson and, and, and ask about it. Uh, but then the problem three, uh, there was a comment that this was a bit tricky. So we kind of follow a similar approach than, than what we had in problem two. So we kind of loop over values and then we need to see if, if a value uh, allocates to this region, this, that or that. And we had basically these kind of uh, coordinates and then we had station names. And basically what you needed to do here is that you needed to iterate over uh, x number of times so basically that number of times how many items you had in these in these uh, stations and latitude and longitude uh, lists and there were some instructions what you should do uh, let's go and check the solution so you had basically in the beginning you had these, so you had some stations and then you had some latitudes and longitudes uh, in, in here. And then basically what we wanted to do is that we wanted to... Um, we wanted to check if the station coordinates are south uh, from, from this point, so latitude 64.5 or uh, longitude and longitude 26.3. So we wanted to check, is it south or north from that point, or is it west or east from that point? So we kind of had two conditions that we wanted to check. And then uh, when we know uh, what, uh, to what, if it's south, so we, we know that then it can be either uh, this or that zone, and then we basically check, okay, is the, uh, longitude value less than this or larger than this uh, 26.3 then we can basically specify that okay it's southwest for example so that's kind of the idea of 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 this and basically we had these cutoff uh, variables here so these are the 
the centroid of, of Finland. So we wanted to use this as a basis for doing the classification and allocation. Then we wanted to create empty lists for all our stations. And what we wanted to do was that we wanted to uh, basically add the name of, of that station into these when we, uh, when we knew what to what zone does the station belong. Uh, then basically how many times do we want to iterate? So we want to iterate n uh, number of times and the n comes from the length of these stations. So basically we want to iterate that number of times how many items we have in this list. And basically these three different lists kind of belong together. So this Hankorussare is the name of the first station and the latitude value of that station is the first number in this list and the longitude uh, coordinate of that station is in this uh, launch uh, list. So that's how kind of you need to go through this. And basically the first uh, thing to do is to create a for loop uh, using the range function and then kind of pick those values from these different lists. And I guess this might have been a bit tricky thing to do if you didn't use this range uh, function to do the loop. Did anyone have problems with kind of understanding and, and doing this? Or was it more or less clear? Okay, there were problems and I guess that is... Uh, yeah, that's not a surprise for us. Let's put it that way. Because if you would start iterating over, for example, one of these lists, then it gets a bit tricky. You can do it, but you need some special tricks that we haven't taught you. So the easiest way is to use this range function. And that is what why we actually, in the lesson materials, we only showed you this uh, way of doing things. But, but yeah, you can always uh, start doing it differently and then you might end up having troubles. But I hope you got help from the assistants to this. Yeah, um, would it be helpful just to see maybe a sort of simple example of how looping over the values themselves in a list compared to using this range function is different? Would that be useful to see? Because maybe for some of you, it's just you're not really clear about what yeah what one versus explain. the other actually does. So maybe we can yeah uh, maybe uh, I put put Hendricky on the spot here and say come up with an example of how to do this. Yeah, uh, let's make a, let's just clean this here and start doing it there. So uh, let's consider kind of the example that we have in this exercise. So we have, for example, two lists and then we want to iterate over and basically do, do things with those. So let's say that we have list A that has some values. Uh, let's say it has two, three, blah, 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 like this. And then we have a list B that has same amount of numbers or values, but they are somehow different like this. And now the idea, so how you can do loops, you can do them, there are different ways. So the kind of way how we wanted you to do the for loop was that we say that for value in range and then how many times you want to iterate is actually the number of times how many items you have in this list a for example and the kind of thing here is that to understand that you don't want to uh, you don't want to combine like the, the counts of these, so you want to check only how many items do you have in this one one list. And then we can basically say that. Well, let's first print. Yeah. 
So we can print the value and then we execute. Uh, and you can see that what we printed out here is our numbers from 0 to 4. And that it, this is basically only the uh, kind of uh, result of this range function that we have here. So the range function creates a list of values from 0 up to the number or number of times that you specify here. And because we have five numbers in this list A, what we have is here is basically five numbers that comes out. But that, this is only a number, it's not any item from those lists. So what we kind of... Can I add something? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't think necessarily that this uh, build a vending machine is the most brilliant way to think of lists ever, but if you think back to how Bill works, right now what we have is the position or the number that would identify some place of one of these items in the vending machine. We don't have the item itself at this point. We just have basically which button to push yeah. in order to get that item when we go and use a for loop here where we're using the range and length functions together. So, you know, that's, it will take a little bit of practice using that and getting used to it, but, uh, you know, it does help to think here essentially what we have are the index yeah. values, the positions of the items in the vending machine, if you want to think of, yeah. of that example. Uh, and now maybe we'll see an example of how to directly get those items. Yeah, so maybe I leave the value be there. Uh, and then basically, as, as Dave said, so now we only have kind of the positions of these values. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But if we want to get that item from that list, let's say item A equals 2. So if we want to get the first number from that list, we were able to do it by doing like list A and then square brackets and what we want to put inside here is the value. So it's the index value uh, that we are iterating over here. So the first number is zero, the second one is one, two, three, four, and, and so on. So we take the item from the list at each iteration, and then we kind of move to the next item and the next one and, and so on. So now if I do it like this, so I uh, create this item A and then I just print out what is that uh, item A and then I run so well yeah this is maybe not the most best thing because we have so many numbers so I just comment out the first one so now what you will see is that uh, anymore we don't have the index number there but what we are printing is the actual item from that list so two three four five six so they are these numbers that are the values inside this list and of course as we have this we can also get the other item from the or the items from this list B and let's do it like this item B equals to list B and then again we want to put the value uh, inside so this is the index uh, of, of in, in each iteration and then we can also print uh, maybe I do so that I instead of doing it like this I print them next to each other so print um, item A and item B and voila so what we are doing here is that basically now we take the items at same index positions at each uh, iteration from these two lists. So we take 
one item from this list A and one item from this list B and then in the end we print out those uh, values. So 2, 5, 3, 4, 4, 3 and so on. So they are basically these values. And this was the trick that you needed to do in problem 3 to find out what is the station name, what is the longitude and what is the latitude coordinate of, of that station. And when you have these values in here, then you needed to do the conditional statements and then check to which zone does that station belong. But as said, so this was supposed to give you the other way of doing uh, the for loop. So basically, I just um, comment these out. So, uh, I guess some of you were doing this in this way, for value in list A. And this is also a really common way of iterating over values in a list. And then when we print out what is the value, so now we don't have any index position here, but uh, ah, sorry, there is a semicolon there. So now we are printing then values inside that list. But now we have a problem that we don't actually know at what is the uh, position of, of the item that we uh, took from this list A. So it, it nicely iterates over them. But if we would like to take the same uh, kind of uh, same value from this other list, we are kind of having problems here because if we, for example, would take the value using this actually item from here, we would get totally kind of uh, wrong uh, items from from that list. So we somehow need to know at what kind of index we are iterating over. And there are different ways of doing this. Uh, what we have shown you is that basically you can say that uh, check the index number. And I put edx equals to value dot the index. Mm -hmm. So what you if you do it like this, you kind of need to check what is the index number of the value that we are iterating over and now yeah. So I, I think it's actually going to be um, list a dot index and then value as the argument. Yeah. So once you oh, find, yeah. find the value within the list. List a dot index dot index and then the evaluate the argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, usually I don't actually use this approach. Uh, but yeah, so and this is probably you know we're showing you this because you can solve the problem this way, but this is not what we would recommend doing because it makes yeah things more complicated. Yeah. So now we have the index. So let's say I print this ID X, so index, I don't print, want to print that. And then when I run this, okay. And now we are back having the actual positions of those values in that list. And now we basically can get the uh, values from the other list as well. So let's say item B equals to uh, list uh, B square brackets and what we want to take there is the item at the index that we, what we are having in this iteration here and again what we want to do is to actually print so print uh, what we print is the value from list A and then 
the item B, so the value from this other list, item, come on, item B, and when we execute, we have the same thing going. So this is kind of uh, the trick that you needed to do, or there are many other tricks as well, but this is kind of one way of doing it that we have already shown you. Yeah. So just to see if anyone's kind of paying attention here, um, what would happen if instead of looking up the index of a value in list A to find its position in list B, if we did things in the opposite, or if we looked using the index function or the index method uh, on list B, to then find the position in list A. Can anyone see in this example why that could be a problem? So what is what's the index method? What what is it actually doing here? What's it telling us when we say list A dot index? Okay, right, so it gives you the index values of, in this case, the number that is stored as value in list A. So it finds where in list A does this number occur. Now, if we did the same thing with list B, is there a problem with that? So it might be a different number, but uh, what about just if you look at the values that are in list B, Yeah, the value 2 is in there twice, and the index function is only going to find the first occurrence of that number in a list. So if we try to do this in the other order, by going through and looking at where in list B is the index of these different numbers, if there's the same value in there twice, we're going to have a problem. So, uh, you know, we showed you this because some people do, I mean, especially when you're learning to use the for loops and to go through list values, there's a tendency to want to go through the values in the list themselves, but doing it with the range function is, in almost every case, is going to be better and easier to understand and more consistent. Here, if we change the values in list A, we can break kind of a few code. Like, for instance, let's just maybe change the value of list A, like change the 4 to a 2 or something like that. Um... We can just change the list itself. Oh, yeah, here. Yeah, just make the four in list A a two. Yeah. So now if we run this, we expect to see the result that's shown under, like, where the 14 is. And we don't get the same numbers that come out in mm -hmm. the values it finds in list B because it goes and finds five a second time instead of finding the three that we expect to see. So if this is like latitude and longitude that you have pairs, you know, each point has a latitude and a longitude, you want to go through and look at all of them together. <coughs> Doing it this way uh, is going to be a problem if, for instance, the latitude or the longitude is repeated in the list. So yeah. uh, I understand that's maybe a little bit confusing to you, but uh, it's a good example of why doing things this way is not a good idea. Yeah. And it's on video. Yeah. So if you're confused, you can go back and watch yeah. the, uh, this part of the video again and see if you can kind of make sense of what, we're, what I'm trying to uh, describe. To. I maybe, this is a bit, there's already quite much stuff for you, but I still want to show you how I do this because I think it's the kind of, uh, at least I think it's, it's the best way of doing this. Can I make a suggestion? No. Um, in the interest of time, could we possibly do this as a separate little yeah, maybe short we can. video? We can record it maybe right after. Yeah, so yeah, we maybe we do so. That's true. Uh, and we'll just put it up on the, the course website. Same thing probably for solving this yeah. the additional problem four. Yeah. Uh, there was a number of questions about like nested <coughs> loops and things like that. I think what we could do is we'll just record a short video yeah, yeah, yeah. after the lecture ends and we can put it up on the, uh, the lesson 
yeah. page and then explain kind of in there how to deal with the, the nested for loop. Maybe I now just quickly go because now we kind of know the basic logic. So how to solve the problem tree. So what we did here was indeed to use the range function to iterate n number of times. And then what we did was just what we just showed you. So we took the items from this latitude, longitude and, 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 and stations, these lists, and then we had those in, in separate variables, latitude, lat, lon and, and station. And then what we wanted to do was to create these conditional statements. So basically, first thing what we wanted to do was to check if the station is south from the central point. So make a conditional uh, statement checking, is it uh, south or north? Basically, because the, the coordinate can be either only south or north, you can use if latitude is uh, less than this north-south cutoff, uh, then execute these. Otherwise, it must be basically on the north side, then do these. And what uh, I used, what is the kind of easiest way of doing was to use these kind of nested uh, if statements. So we create uh, first check, is it south? If, if it is, then we create another layer of conditions checking, is it uh, west or east? from the, the kind of cent, uh, central centroid of, of Finland. And then if it's west, then uh, assign the value or add it to the southwest list. If it's not west, it must be east. And, and in that case, you add it to the other, other list. And, and this is the kind of basic logic how to solve this thing. So I guess it's kind of uh, intuitive when you see it. Of course, when you do this for the first time, nothing seems to be too intuitive, but, but this is kind of how this uh, problem tree would have been solved. Yeah, but maybe now uh, when taking a look at the time, we need to move forward to the actual contents of, of this week. Yeah, so um, if are there any kind of burning questions or urgent questions. Um, if not, then yeah, we should probably move to our lesson this week.